When the Browning M2 machine gun first entered service in the early 1920s, aviation was a fundamentally different world. Aircraft were constructed from wood and fabric, carried minimal armour, and mounted perhaps one or two guns. In this environment, the 50 caliber represented a quantum leap in aerial firepower. Each round, weighing 46 grams and travelling at nearly 3,000 feet per second, could tear through the fragile construction of contemporary aircraft with devastating effect. Against the light fighters and bombers of the era, the 50 caliber was nothing short of revolutionary. But even as American factories began producing the M2 Browning in quantity, the world of military aviation was undergoing a transformation that would challenge every assumption about aerial warfare. Throughout the 1930s, engine technology advanced with breathtaking speed. The power plants that had struggled to lift lightly armed biplanes suddenly could propel fighters carrying armor plate, self-sealing fuel tanks and batteries of heavy weapons. What had seemed impossible in 1925 became routine by 1939. Aircraft weren't just getting faster. They were becoming flying fortresses that could absorb punishment unimaginable to earlier generations. The Spanish Civil War became aviation's proving ground, where theoretical designs met brutal reality. German Condor Legion pilots discovered that their light machine guns, adequate against fabric-covered biplanes, were pathetically inadequate against newer armoured aircraft. Soviet fighters arrived with armour plating protecting pilots and engines. Rounds that would have been lethal five years earlier now bounced harmlessly off steel plate. The Germans learned a harsh lesson. Firepower that couldn't penetrate protection was worthless regardless of accuracy. This revelation drove German aviation philosophy toward a radical solution. Rather than mounting numerous light weapons, they would install fewer but vastly more powerful cannons. The MGF F 20mm cannon, based on the Swiss Erlikon design, entered Luftwaffe service mounting explosive shells that could cripple aircraft with single hits. Each 20mm mine shell contained approximately 18 grams of high explosive, vastly exceeding anything comparable caliber weapons could deliver. Where machine gun bullets punched holes, cannon shells detonated, sending fragments through hydraulic lines, control cables, fuel tanks, and crew compartments. The British faced the same revelation during the Battle of Britain. Though they arrived at it through desperate experience rather than Spanish combat, the Supermarine Spitfire and Hawker Hurricane initially mounted eight Browning 303 machine guns, creating what designers believed would be overwhelming firepower through sheer volume. The mathematics seemed sound. Eight guns firing at over 1,000 rounds per minute created a cone of lead that nothing could survive. Reality proved otherwise. German bombers arrived over Britain with armour protection that rendered the 303 largely ineffective. Pilots emptied entire ammunition loads into Heinkel and Dornier bombers only to watch them continue flying. The small calibre bullets, while numerous, simply lacked the energy to penetrate armour plate or inflict catastrophic damage. Fighter command desperately needed weapons that could kill with fewer hits since combat typically offered only seconds of firing opportunity. The answer was the 20mm Hispano cannon, though early installations proved plagued with jamming problems that wouldn't be fully resolved until 1942. The British learned what would become aerial combat's fundamental truth. In actual combat, pilots rarely had time for extended gunnery runs. Engagements lasted seconds. The enemy flashed through your gun sight, you fired a brief burst, then he was gone. In these fleeting moments, the destructive power of individual hits mattered far more than theoretical rates of fire. A two-second burst that landed three 20mm shells could destroy a bomber. The same burst with rifle-caliber machine guns might not even slow it down. Germany pushed this philosophy to its logical extreme with the MK 108 30mm cannon, specifically designed for destroying American and British heavy bombers. Weighing just 58 kilograms despite its massive 30mm bore, the MK-108 fired shells containing over 80 grams of high explosive at 650 rounds per minute. Against the formations of B-17s and B-24s darkening European skies, German fighter pilots needed weapons that could destroy four-engine bombers before defensive gunners cut them to pieces. The 30mm delivered that capability. Four MK-108 cannons, the standard armament on the ME-262 jet fighter, could theoretically destroy a heavy bomber with a single half-second burst. Yet across the Atlantic, American fighter designers reached precisely the opposite conclusion. 
the United States would standardize on the 50 caliber Browning, mounting six to eight guns per fighter throughout the war. This decision, which German and British analysts initially viewed as backwards, proved devastatingly effective within the American operational context. The crucial factor, American forces in both European and Pacific theaters primarily face single-engine fighters and medium bombers, not the four-engine heavy bombers that forced Germany to adopt heavier cannons. The mathematics of American firepower were compelling. 650 caliber Brownings, the standard armament on aircraft like the P-51 Mustang, delivered 4,500 rounds per minute of combined fire. Each gun carried between 270 and 400 rounds, providing roughly 20 to 30 seconds of sustained fire. The Browning's muzzle velocity of nearly 3,000 feet per second gave it superior ballistics compared to 20 mm cannons, requiring less lead angle and making gunnery simpler for average pilots. American ammunition development proved equally significant. The M8 armor-piercing incendiary round combined penetrating power with incendiary effects that could ignite fuel tanks and hydraulic fluid. At typical combat ranges under 400 meters, the 50 caliber could penetrate the armor protection on Japanese and German single-engine fighters. It couldn't match the explosive destructive power of 20 mm shells, but six guns firing simultaneously created sufficient destructive potential against the targets American pilots actually encountered. Critically, the 50 caliber offered unmatched reliability. The Browning M2 was a mature, proven design with over 20 years of development behind it. It functioned flawlessly in the temperature extremes from Pacific sea level to European high altitude combat. Ammunition feeding was utterly reliable. Stoppages were rare. When every gun system faces the test of combat reliability, the weapon that works every time holds tremendous advantage over theoretically superior weapons that jam at critical moments. The standardization advantage cannot be overstated. Every American fighter, from carrier-based Hellcats to land-based Thunderbolts, used the same 50 caliber ammunition. Supply chains could be simplified, armorers trained on one weapon system, pilots transitioning between aircraft types faced familiar armament, this logistical elegance allowed American forces to maintain operational tempo that their enemies couldn't match. German fighters might carry superior weapons, but not if ammunition shortages or maintenance problems kept them grounded. The Pacific Theater demonstrated American armament philosophy at its finest. Japanese fighters, built for maximum maneuverability at the expense of protection, were devastatingly vulnerable to 50 caliber fire. The S6M0, lacking armor plate and self-sealing fuel tanks, could be destroyed by relatively few hits. American pilots trained to fight using energy tactics rather than turning combat would make slashing high-speed passes delivering concentrated bursts from six guns. The cumulative effect of 30 to 50 hits in two seconds was catastrophic against unarmored aircraft. The F6F Hellcat, mounting 650 calibers with 2,400 rounds total ammunition, achieved a kill ratio of 19 to 1 against Japanese aircraft. This wasn't because the 50 caliber was inherently superior to cannons. It was because the weapon matched perfectly with American tactical doctrine, reliable fire control systems, and the specific targets encountered. Hellcat pilots could afford to fire longer bursts, confident their ammunition wouldn't jam, and they carried sufficient rounds for multiple engagements. Over Europe, the situation proved more complex. German fighters carried increasingly heavy armor protection by 1943, and American bomber defensive positions featured armor plate that could deflect 20 mm shells. Had American fighters faced the same four-engine heavy bomber threats that German fighters encountered, cannons would have been essential, but they didn't. American fighters primarily fought German single-engine fighters, where 650 calibers provided more than adequate destructive power while offering superior ballistics for long-range shooting. The ground attack mission revealed both strengths and limitations. Along French roads in the summer of 1944, P-47s strafed German truck convoys with devastating effect. 50 caliber bullets easily penetrated truck bodies, fuel tanks and cargo areas. They lacked the explosive power of 20 mm shells, but volume compensated. A two second burst placed 60 to 70 rounds into the target area, virtually guaranteeing destruction of soft skinned vehicles. German Fokker Wolf 190 fighters performing similar missions with 20mm cannons achieved comparable results, 
proving both weapon systems worked effectively against unarmored ground targets. The weight consideration deserves examination. A typical American fighter installation of 650 caliber Brownings with full ammunition weighed approximately 800 pounds. A comparable German installation with four MG 151-20mm cannons and ammunition weighed roughly 900 pounds. The weight penalty for cannons was real, but not overwhelming. However, the German system provided 1,200 to 1,600 rounds total, while the American system offered 1,800 to 2,400 rounds. The American pilot could afford longer bursts and more gunnery passes before exhausting ammunition. Rate of fire comparisons reveal interesting mathematics. Six Brownings firing at 750 rounds per minute, each delivered 4,500 rounds per minute combined. 4 MG 151 cannons firing at 700 rounds per minute, each provided 2,800 rounds per minute combined. The American installation delivered 60% more projectiles downrange per unit time, though each individual projectile carried less destructive power. Against fighters, where multiple hits were typically required anyway, the volume advantage proved significant. Ballistic performance heavily favoured the 50 caliber. With muzzle velocity around 2,900 feet per second, the 50 caliber round maintained flatter trajectory than 20 millimeter shells traveling between 2,300 and 2,600 feet per second. This meant American pilots needed less deflection angle when shooting at maneuvering targets, simplifying gunnery and improving hit probability. Against the weaving, dodging fighters that constituted most targets, this ballistic advantage translated directly into combat effectiveness. The explosive content comparison tells the cannon story. A 20mm mine shell contained roughly 18 grams of high explosive. A 50 caliber round contained perhaps 2 grams of incendiary material. The cannon shell delivered 9 times more explosive effect per hit. This meant fewer cannon hits could achieve aircraft destruction. Combat assessments suggested 3 to 5 20mm hits could down a fighter while the 50 caliber typically required 10 to 20 hits depending on placement. However, the Browning's higher hit probability from superior ballistics partially offset this disadvantage. German fighter pilots facing American bombers desperately needed the destructive power of 30 mm cannons. A B-17 Flying Fortress, with four engines, redundant control systems, and extensive armor protection, could absorb dozens of 20 mm hits and hundreds of rifle caliber hits while continuing flight. But three or four MK-108 30 mm shells, each containing 85 grams of high explosive, could destroy critical structural elements or detonate fuel tanks. Against such targets, only cannons provided sufficient single-hit lethality. American forces never faced equivalent targets in air-to-air -air combat. Japanese bombers were relatively lightly constructed, and typically encountered in small numbers. German bombers over Allied territory were rare by 1944. The heavy four-engine targets that would have demanded cannon armament simply weren't present in American operational experience. The 50 caliber proved entirely adequate for the missions actually flown while offering advantages in other areas. The development trajectory reveals American pragmatism. By 1943, the US Navy was actively testing 20mm cannon installations for carrier fighters. The F-4U Corsair could be equipped with four 20mm cannons in place of 650 calibers. These installations entered service in 1945, seeing limited combat before war's end. The lessons learned would inform post-war fighter design, where cannons became standard. But during World War II, the maturity and reliability of the 50 caliber made it the superior practical choice. Training implications heavily favored standardized armament. American pilots learned gunnery using the same weapons they would carry in combat. Training ammunition was essentially identical to combat ammunition. Gun camera footage showed exactly where rounds were going. This seamless progression from training to combat enhanced pilot effectiveness. German pilots, particularly late war replacements, sometimes reached operational units having never fired their actual combat weapons due to ammunition shortages and the variety of armament configurations. The final consideration is the one that mattered most, operational results. American fighters equipped with 50 caliber armament achieved air superiority over both Germany and Japan. They destroyed enemy fighters in vast numbers, shot down bombers, supported ground forces and enabled allied victory.
Whether cannon armament might have achieved these results more efficiently is ultimately academic. The 50 caliber did achieve them, demonstrably and completely. By war's end, the aerial combat environment was changing in ways that would indeed favor cannon armament. Jet fighters flying at higher speeds reduced engagement time even further, making single-hit lethality more important. Heavier aircraft construction and better armor made multiple light hits less effective. The Korean War, just five years after World War II's end, would see American fighters finally standardized on 20mm cannons. The 50 calibers era was ending. But during World War II, in the specific tactical situations American forces encountered against the specific targets they engaged, using the specific operational doctrines they employed, the 50 caliber Browning proved magnificently effective. Six guns delivering concentrated fire with excellent ballistics, absolute reliability, and sufficient armor penetration against single-engine fighters represented an optimal solution for American requirements. It wasn't the weapon system with the most destructive power per hit. It was the weapon system that worked, every time, in every condition, delivering victory. The comparison between American 50 caliber and German 20 mm armament ultimately reveals not that one was superior, but that each was optimized for different requirements. German fighters needed maximum single-hit destructive power to quickly destroy heavy bombers before defensive fire became fatal. American fighters needed sustained firepower with excellent ballistics against agile single-engine fighters. Both nations made rational decisions based on operational realities. Both weapon systems succeeded within their intended contexts. The notion that the 50 caliber was inadequate or that America made a mistake persisting with machine guns rather than adopting cannons ignores operational context entirely. American pilots weren't requesting cannon armament because the 50 caliber was failing them. It wasn't. They were achieving kill ratios that demonstrated overwhelming superiority. The weapon worked. When something works, changing it for theoretical improvements risks degrading actual performance. The ugly truth is that there is no ugly truth. The 50 caliber versus 20 mm debate has no universal answer because the question itself is contextual. In the hands of American pilots, fighting the air war America actually fought, the 50 caliber was exactly the right weapon. In the hands of German pilots, fighting swarms of heavy bombers, cannons were essential. Both were correct, both were necessary, both contributed to their nation's tactical approach to aerial warfare. The weapon that seems inadequate in one context proves ideal in another, Understanding this reveals more about warfare than any technical specification ever could.